Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of AFR's EMS Case Studies. My name is Chris Ortiz. I'm the EMS Division Chief for Albuquerque Fire Rescue. And as always, joined by our medical director, Dr. Kim Pruitt. Hi, Chief. Welcome, Doc. And we're also joined today by Lieutenant Stephen Penfold. Chief, thank you for joining us, coming to talk about your case. Um, Rescue 19, it's your current assignment and sounds, or um, uh, yeah, on this call, it was Rescue 19 as well. You guys were dispatched to a six Delta, and it sounds like for a 91-year-old female with trouble breathing. That's correct. Let us know about some of the information that you got on dispatch and how that compared to what you found on scene. Well, um, it's pretty limited anymore, I think, on what we get from dispatch, especially now we don't get the dispatcher's comments anymore. But um, for me personally, whenever I see 91 years old, I'm always thinking it's probably COPD or CHF. It's normally going to be something along those lines. So um, that was what we were thinking. Um, that's kind of what me and my partner were talking about on the way in there. Um, and I got to throw out, I got a great crew I've been working with for years. So they always make me look really good. That's what I always tell them. So. Um, yeah, we just go through as we arrived on scene. Yeah, so okay, you guys, yeah. you guys got there. You were kind of talking through it before you arrived, so you kind of know what your game plan is going to be. Sure. Um, so you get there. What did you guys find? Uh, it was a single family dwelling. Uh, we were directed inside, um, and we went back to a back bedroom uh, where the patient. Um, the first thing that kind of caught my eye was that initial assessment of they looked sick or not sick, and they absolutely looked sick. But what kind of caught my attention was the fact that they were laying down and kind of propped to the right which is I've seen that with family members of people who've had CHF, and then also anyone who's trouble breathing who's laying down is always kind of a flag for me. Uh, so my crew did great. Those guys jumped in there right away and got her um, set up and propped up with some pillows behind her. Um, and she was on uh, home oxygen, and it was a low sat with that. And then um, while they were already kind of jumping on everything with that and getting in title on and getting everything kind of taken care of, um, I ended up um, kind of trying to talk with the, the caregiver to figure out what was going on. And that's kind of where I started seeing this trend that they had been taking the vital signs all that morning, that the pressure was increasing the whole time. And um, so that was kind of a flag as well. And then I started looking at medications, and I didn't see any COPD medications or anything along those lines. And while I was doing that, my crew was letting me know what was going on. They told me that it was wet lung sounds, which is kind of what I was expecting. So I was like, okay, let's let's get a 12 lead on. And those guys, are like I said, they make me look good. So they, they were already jumping on that. And... Um, Right about that time, I think it was about when um, AS was showing up. So they showed up on scene. I kind of gave them kind of a quick rundown. Hey, I think this is CHF exacerbation. We're, let's probably go down nitro route, especially with these pressures. And um, I believe the pressure they had, the last one they got before we showed up was like 190 over 100 or somewhere around there, which is obviously really high. But even for us, it was even higher. I think it was like 240 over like 117 or 114 or something along those lines. And it actually was still trending up even with our second vital signs we had on scene. So. Yeah, it looks like your trend's starting at 242 over 117, your repeat at 255 over 121, heart rate of 100, her sats were about 80% on maybe that home O2. Correct. Um, you guys jumped on cap, no, looks like you got 32. Um, so yeah, those vital signs were really jumping out and kind of matching the diagnosis that you had already pre-planned. Yeah, and uh, I, I think that's, uh, CPAP's like huge, and, and I think that we've had this before with plenty of other patients. Um, we don't normally get the pressures quite that high, which is where I started thinking that we really need to do um, some nitro as well. But um, my guys were already hooking her up and trying to talk her into that, and she was doing really well actually with that. Um, even just, just the improvement with that, she was actually was able to tell us that she felt better. You could see her labored breathing was starting to decrease a little bit, and um, so that was already trending in the right direction just with that treatment alone, which is, I think, one of the fastest ones you can see on scene. Fastest and easiest and most beneficial, I think, to those to those patients for sure. So you got the CPAP going. You started to see some improvement with that. What was your next steps in terms of treatment for her? Well, and so we get that the 12 lead came back, which was before we give nitro. That's what I was really was looking for. I didn't want to see any signs of like anything inferior or right-sided or anything along those lines or any other cardiac involvement. Um, and so I was looking here, and I actually didn't remember. I had to look at this. I'm glad you guys included it. But <laughs> it was a, so it was a right bundle, um, kind of a sinus right bundle. There was really no other signs of any kind of other um, ectopia or anything that we were seeing going on. So uh, that was good. So we knew we were in the clear for that. And so while I was actually doing that, the um, AS permit, I could actually have stepped out to call uh, consortium about um, giving nitro um, because he had thought that for paramedics we had to also call. So that was actually something we talked about afterwards because I was like, I don't think we have to. I think it's just the intermediates. And so we pulled up the protocol and kind of talked about it for a minute. And we're like, oh, yeah, no, we don't have to. So, um, yeah, so we ended up getting the nitro um, there on scene before we were leaving. Um, as they were going to pull off the patient, we had given the nitro. So, um, Awesome. And 0.4 nitro. 0.4. That's every yep. three to five. Every three to five up to 1.2 milligram champ. Awesome. Um, Doc, talk to us a little bit about CHF. Um, I know we encounter it regularly, but not as regularly, I think, as COPD and some of our other 
um, respiratory illnesses. So how do we differentiate? How do we treat? Yeah, so there's a, this is a great case, and you give excellent care here. Good job recognizing oh, sure. it um, and what was going on and then doing the right treatments. Um, with CHF, you basically have a very sick heart. The heart's not getting enough oxygen. Um, it's not functioning well for whatever reason, and it something tips it over into where there's this like sympathetic surge. And so the blood pressure typically will go very high. Sometimes the heart rate's high. And as a consequence of this demand for oxygen from the heart, the brain increases the blood pressure. Then the heart has to work harder, and it's this very difficult cycle for the heart to maintain perfusion and as a result fluid tends to accumulate in the lungs and so the idea here is to stop the sympathetic surge and we can do that by one relieving the breathing too because you're providing more oxygen and so CPAP is a great move um, to one not only displace the fluid in the lungs but also provide extra oxygenation and then helping stop the sympathetic surge by giving the nitroglycerin to help decrease that blood pressure and kind of stop that cycle. Um, you can use, sometimes it's difficult to diagnose in the field, the tools that I like to use, it's kind of multimodal, just exactly what you did. Use the patient history. A lot of times they'll know they have heart failure or you'll see Lasix on their, um, on their medication list to help distribute some of that water uh, out of their body. And then um, CAPNO actually is a really great tool, which you mentioned here, uh, to help differentiate between COPD because both of these presentations can present similarly, uh, but it's a very different thing that's going on. And it's a very different approach to treatment. Um, so using your CAPNO and obviously in COPD, you'll have the shark fin waveform, maybe a higher um, in title. Whereas in CHF, sometimes it'll either be acidotic or normal with a nice square waveform. And I really like to use that to help with the uh, differentiating causes of shortness of breath. And since they are difficult to differentiate, but COT COPD is probably the most prevalent, we kind of go into that mode of, look, I kind of know CPAP. I know albuterol with my duoneb. Why no albuterol for the CHF? So albuterol can actually cause a little bit of harm here. I know we tend to think about it as um, a relatively benign drug because we give it a lot. And most of the time it is benign. But in this situation, in a bad heart failure exacerbation, you have this sympathetic surge already going on where the heart rate's high, the respiratory drive is high, the myocardial oxygen demand is high, the blood pressure is high. And then we give another beta agonist on top of that and you're making it worse. And so um, being very cautious before you give that albuterol to an elderly patient that's short of breath, just taking that second to ask yourself, could this be CHF? And, and while you're figuring that out, it's okay because the good news is CPAP works great for both. So you can throw that CPAP on, address, address the respiratory issue, and then, and then work on the history and on the back end to decide whether or not albuterol is the right call. Okay. So the crew made you look good, but it was all you making these solid decisions. So with your course of treatment that you had kind of outlined for your team to execute, did you start to see an improvement um, in the patient? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like as mentioned, um, CPAP is one of the quickest things that we normally see improvement with. And we had actually kind of talked to her. You could see decreased uh, labor of respirations um, already in her and decreased effort. Um, but I was able to talk with her a little bit before she had left the scene and asked her if she was feeling she was better, and she was giving us thumbs up and nodding, and you could just you could see an improvement in her skin color and stuff already. So we already knew we were, were headed in the right direction, and we just wanted to really kind of get along that nitro to increase that effect and uh, decrease the preload and offload some of that fluid from the lungs. Correct. Did she complain of any chest pain secondary? To uh, I, I think the, she never told us anything, but obviously she's probably having a hard time talking and wasn't able to communicate with us. I think the caregivers had said she might have had some chest discomfort or something along the way and never were able to substantiate that with her. Um, Are we so good? We could have done um, aspirin, right? I don't think there's anything contraindication. That's what I was going to ask, Doc. Are we of... okay to we go down that route? Now we've addressed the, the breathing issues, and now they can talk with us a little bit more so we can do a more thorough assessment. Um, and if they elicit that they've had some chest pain or discomfort, should we go down the ACS route secondary to this? I would go ahead and explore chest pain in the setting of a CHF exacerbation. This lady was hypoxic. She's probably got some ischemic injury to her already at baseline kind of sick heart. Right. And um, mm -hmm. between the respiratory distress, distress, the super high blood pressure and the hypoxia, there could have been an element of ACS in this too. It's probably all demand ischemia. But I don't think aspirin is a bad idea at all because these these hearts at baseline are already not functioning perfectly. And then you add on the level of distress that she was in and it can get a lot worse. 
Albuquerque Ambulance Transport, or did we? They did transport, did. yeah. Okay. And, and her presentation was a lot more stable. You said upon turnover. By the time we were loading her over, yeah. Fantastic. You guys did a, an amazing job on this call. And although it seems straightforward, it is a, a call that we don't get quite as often, right? Yeah, we don't give nitro maybe once or twice a month when I'm looking at charts. And so I think there's opportunities where we could be giving it more. But like you said, it's not a drug we use very frequently and it's not um, that common of an indication. So I'm, I'm glad we're talking about this so people will get comfortable using it in the right situation. And this was the, the perfect patient to use it in. And I think the, the biggest thing is with nitro, we know that it came out of our ACS algorithm Right, so right. a lot of people are under the impression that oh, we just don't use that anymore, which isn't the case. There is a certain patient population, CHF specifically, that does absolutely benefit from getting the nitro. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Great job again. Can't say it enough. Um, a lot of new paramedics coming out of our last class. A lot of new officers that are recently promoted. Um, with your experience, is there any other? words of wisdom on how you have differentiated between the CHF and the COPD and why your thought process, I guess, just goes there with a certain age group and demographic. Um, well, I think you guys kind of already covered everything. I mean, history, and it's kind of a, it's not any one specific thing. It's looking at the whole picture of the patient on the presentation and the history are probably some of the biggest ones. And then um, lung sounds. Lung sounds, on the, listen for the wheezing, that construction versus the rails and the fluid accumulation in there. So. Probably something that we don't do practice, I guess I should say, on enough, right? Listening to what normal lung sounds sound like. I think mm -hmm. practicing even in the station, as silly as that may seem, to know what normal lung sounds sound like compared to adventitious lung sounds, I think is key. So great job on that. Well, the crew made you look good. You made the division, the department look good. So great job on this call. Uh, thank you for coming out and sharing the case. I appreciate it. Thank you, Doc, as always. Uh, if anybody has any interesting cases uh, that they want to share, feel free to reach out to us in the EMS division, or you can use our SharePoint tab, um, and let's come talk about these cases. That's the way we get the information out. But until then, we'll see you next time. Thank you all.